Father, thank you for this great company. Thank you for bringing us to this point where we can always share your word together. This is not our word. This is your word which we must live by. As the Bible says, until we grow into the stature of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we must be doing. We thank you for such an opportunity once again to share your word. I pray, O oh God, that let somebody be touched, even if it's one person. Let somebody, let somebody receive some grace and revelation. This is all we pray for. We do not only come here to come and preach. We come and share your word so that somebody's life can be touched. Thank you for what you are doing and thank you for what you continue to do. And thank you for what you accomplish in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Okay, okay, okay. God bless you. The topic that I was given says freed to serve. Freed to serve. So there are two words here to be freed and also to serve. So I'm going to try and explain these two. But I will start off with Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. And I'm reading from the King James Version. It says that. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. So, you are taken out, freed from bondage, and then when you come, you come and serve. Now, all this is summed up in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, 19, and 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, 19, and 21. Jesus died for us to set free, to set us free, not to serve ourselves, but to live a life of service to God and service to others as well. Now, by the grace of God, we are free to serve God out of love and gratitude for all he has done for us. Our freedom, of course, is not freedom to be selfish and indulge in the flesh. So that is what it is. We've been freed, but our freedom is not unto ourselves. Our freedom is not unto ourselves. Our freedom is not to indulge in our selfish fleshly desires, but to serve God. So what is this Christian freedom that we are talking about? I am going to do a lot of reading from Galatians, Galatians in my, um, uh, what do you call it, opening um, versions. So the Bible states emphatically in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, that believers are free in Christ. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for freedom. Before Jesus died on the cross, God's people lived under a detailed system of laws that served as a moral compass to guide their lives. 
And this I am talking about the children of Israel. They lived under the law of Moses. And the law was a moral compact to guide their lives. So the law, the law was what ruled whatever they did. And in Ghana today, or wherever, wherever you find yourself, those of you in the U.S., you know that the constitution of the land places some responsibilities on you. And the constitution is what guides what anyone does, even from the president to the least of the country. But we are talking about spiritual freedom. The law, while powerless to grant salvation or produce true freedom, nevertheless pointed the way to Jesus Christ. And this, when you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 to 24 again, you will see that everything about the law pointed to Jesus. Through his sacrificial death, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law setting believers free from the law of sin and death so we are not under the law of moses we are under the law we, we were under the law of sin and death which jesus came to free us from the law of sin and death god's laws are now written in our hearts through the spirit of god and we are free to follow and serve christ in ways that please and glorify him. Romans chapter 8, 2 to 8. I don't want to read all the scriptures, so I'm summarizing. So, in short, this is the definition of Christian freedom. We are freed from the law of sin and death. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we are freed from sin and death. And now we have been brought into eternal life. And this eternal life that he has given us, the laws are written within our hearts. Nobody forces you to do what you must do, but it is written, with, written within your heart and you must do it as it pleases the Lord, not as it pleases us. So an important aspect of Christian freedom is our responsibility not to return to living under the law. Or not to return to living under sin and death. So the Apostle Paul compared this to slavery. He says, Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That is Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. So continuing to live under sin and death after salvation is merely a legalistic form of religion. You are, you are bound spiritually in religion. We cannot end righteousness through the law. And for us, sin and death. Rather, it is its purpose was to define our sin and show our need of a savior. So Christian freedom involves living not under the burdensome obligations of the law, but under God's grace. So, we are no more under the law, we are under grace. So, when we go down, you see exactly what we are talking about. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. So, you see, the death of Jesus Christ brought us under grace. And grace brings so much freedom, so much freedom, that we are liberty to do many things on our own. But you see, all these things emanate from the freedom that we received from Jesus. But it is not to say that we can go and do what we want to do out of our own will and volition. But we have to do what is written in our hearts. We are free to do things that will please the Lord. So in Christ, we are free from the Lord's oppressive system. We are free from the penalty of sin. And we are free from the power of sin. So Christian freedom is not a license to sin. And let me put it this way. Grace is not the license to sin. So the Bible says that 
Must we continue to sin so that grace will abound? Of course not. In fact, under grace, under grace, there is so much freedom. There is so much freedom under grace. To the point that, so under grace, when you sin, you only confess. And when you confess genuinely from your heart, you are forgiven. In those days, it was not so. Every sin had a punishment. Every sin had a punishment. So we are free in Christ, but not free to live however we want, indulging the flesh. For we have been called to live in freedom. So that is why Paul says, my brothers and sisters, <laughs> we have not been called to live in freedom the way we want but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature instead use your freedom to serve one another in love galatians 5 13 in love to serve one another in love we should use our freedom to serve one another in love that is why i started by saying that the greatest satisfaction you can ever get in life is when you are serving god at a point in my life, I was asking myself, so is that all? Is that all there is to life? Like, go to school, get a job, marry, have children, travel a few times, make some money, get a house. Then is that all? What is it again? Well, what is there again to achieve? Is that all? So they bring to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Then... It, it sends you to self-actualization where you want to prove a point then after that what next so you see there is so much joy in serving the lord but we will understand later believers aren't free to sin but free to live holy lives in christ christian freedom is one of the many paradoxes of the christian faith so true freedom means willingly this is the definition. Christian freedom means willingly becoming a slave to Christ. And this happens through relationship with him. That is why Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 now. You see, now the life that I live is not my own life, but Christ that lives in me. This is the true definition of Christian freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 16 to 17 in romans chapter 6 paul explains that when a believer accepts christ he or she is baptized by the spirit into christ's death burial and resurrection at that moment the believer ceases to be a slave to sin and becomes a servant of righteousness but thanks be to god that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart so nobody put a cane or a cane or a gun on your head to force you to do the right thing but you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness hallelujah so to be a slave of righteousness is not the word slaves in its true sense. So somebody says, ah, but if Christ has set me free, why should I become a slave of Christ again? They got it wrong. Only Christians know true freedom. Only Christians know true freedom. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That is John 8, 36. But what does Christian freedom look like in a practical sense? What does it look like in a practical sense? What are we free to do or not do? That that can be that 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 can be looked at in this form. So, what can we eat? What can we watch on television? What can we wear to the beach? What about smoking and drinking? Are there limits to Christian freedom? So, Many of these things are not defined in the Bible. I've heard 
have heard arguments that says that drink but don't don't get drunk and there are many arguments that the bible did this categorically state that you shouldn't drink so you can drink a little wine they call it red wine you can do this you can watch anything you can go to the beach and wear a bikini you can do anything you can smoke of course there is no there is nothing that binds you like rigidly to some of these things but there are there limits to christian freedom are there limits these are the questions which you ask in first Corinthians chapter 10 the apostle paul gives a practical illustration of christian freedom everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial everything is permissible but not everything is constructive this Amen. is from niv nobody should seek his own good but the good of others so this is what it all means the christian freedom this is what it means it says that everything from the niv everything is permissible yes. but not everything is beneficial then he goes on to say everything is permissible but not everything is constructive nobody should seek his own good but the good of others first corinthians chapter 10 23 to 24. in writing to the church of Corinth, paul mentions members who were attending meals in pagan, tem pagan temples just as they had done before receiving christ they felt free to continue participating because they thought these festivals were merely a moral normal part of the social culture they didn't see their actions as pagan worship so for those of my brothers who are coming from teshi you know when it is teshi la osu uh, gamashi and all those areas during the period of the homo war around august september there is quickly and then there is there is this debate that, that, that this debate you know was on for a long time i remember when i was a young man this is what it was a big debate as to whether on the day of the home wash should believers also participate or go and stand and watch should believers participate in the quick way for those of you who no. are accounts you know no. what i'm saying so so paul tend to address some of this and paul laid out several warnings reminding the corinthians of several dangerous fil filtration with adultery in the old testament then he handled the practical concern of eating meat that have been sacrificed to others in this case we are looking at quickly everything is permissible the christians were saying true paul says christians have a great deal of freedom in christ however not everything is beneficial or constructive our freedom in christ must be balanced by a desire to build up and benefit others when deciding how our christian freedom we ought to seek the good of others before our own good so Amen. that is what christian freedom is all about so let's look at in judaism in judaism restrictions were placed on purchasing meats in the market you know the jews had a lot of laws and they lived by it that is why up till now many jews do not believe in jesus because they are hooked up to the law jews mm. could not jews jews could only buy and eat kosher meats paul said believers were free in christ to buy and eat meat that is first corinthians chapter 10 25 to 26 however if the issue of meat sacrifice to idols came up believers were to follow a higher law love is what limits christians love is what limits christians and that is where our freedom lies it is not a very rigid law to say eat this or don't eat that but love for the others love for others a little later in the chapter paul wrote about eating meat as a guest in someone's home christians are free to eat whatever they have served without questions of, of conscience first corinthians chapter 10 verse 27 but if someone brings up that the meat has been offered to an idol it is better not to eat it for the sake of the person who raised the issue of conscience that is verse 28 
while believers have freedom to eat the meat they are compelled to consider what's best for those who are observing their behavior and you know mm. when we were growing up you know now a lot has changed when we were growing up even wearing trousers was a problem by ladies was a problem mm. but as knowledge you know increased we have seen that all those things did not mean anything it is of the heart however if you are wearing a kind of trouser that is so tight and it shows everything and you as a believer it becomes a stumbling block for another person then you must consider that person not necessarily because you don't feel like wearing trouser or you're offending anybody but just because you don't want to destroy that person's faith so these are the areas of our freedom which we we have to take note so so what is the limit what is the limit of our christian freedom what is the limit in romans chapter 14 verse 1 to 13 raises a key determiner in understanding the limits of christian freedom in this in the passage paul again brings up the issue of eating meat sacrificed to elders and also observing certain holy holy days some of the believers felt freedom in christ in these areas while others did not their different perspectives were causing quarrels and disunity paul emphasized that unity and love in the body of christ are more important than anyone's personal convictions or christian liberty so some people say we have to worship on saturday because that is a sabbath day another group says it's supposed to be on sunday all those things do not matter the most important thing is how you are serving god in your heart therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another instead make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister period romans chapter 14 verse 13. so essentially paul's message to the new testament believers and to us today is that even if we believe we are right and have freedom in an area if our actions will cause another brother or sister to stumble in his or her faith we are to refrain out of love we are to refrain out of love so for instance you live in a locality where you pray in tongues so loudly and you disturb people and sometimes the people who come and tell you that you are disturbing their peace are even staunch believers but in ghana we brand them as witches and wizards you know and my wife tells me a story that there were some two young believers who lived in a compound house and every night they prayed extensively deep into the night then there is this the landlady sells at the market and she leaves home very early by four o'clock she's gone and this woman comes home and just wants to sleep and rest and these young believers are praying loudly and and disturbing and when she she speaks they say she's a witch so <laughs> these are some of the things so our freedom should be measured in the love for others space paul spoke again of the matter in first Corinthians chapter 8 7 to 9 some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sac sacrificial food they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god and since their conscience is weak it is defiled but food does not bring us near to god that is what we must know we are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do be careful however that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak so the issue about the quick way is that you can eat people at any time if you knew how to prepare it it's just some uh, corn flour and some uh, mixed with some red oil and and uh, and palm nut soup if you can cook it cook it and eat but you just have where to eat it at the time when the homo people are eating it just because of other people otherwise it is food Man. just a portion of it is sprinkled to idols so for some people they will feel offended if you are christian and you eat with them the issue in the new testament times was eating meat offered to idols today there are other gray areas that raise our christian work that arise in our christian work 
Romans chapter 14 verse 1 calls these reputable matters. Disputable matters, sorry. Romans chapter 14 verse 1 calls these disputable matters. Areas where the Bible does not give clear-cut guidelines on whether, whether a behavior is sin. When we are faced with gray areas, we can rely on two guiding principles to regulate our Christian freedom. Let love for others compel us not to cause anyone to stumble. And let our desire to glorify God be our all-encompassing motive. So if praying loudly in tongues is disturbing your neighbor, just consider your neighbor and live peacefully. You can pray under your breath and pray. God will hear your prayer. And the Bible even says that even the silent prayers, even at the time, Romans chapter 8, I think verse, 20, uh, the verse um, 26 or so, when it talks about the fact that the Spirit himself separates our infirmities, such that even in the days when we cannot pray, you know, Amen. the Spirit prays for us with groanings that words cannot express. So you don't always have to shout. You have to consider other people's liberties and freedoms. So what it means to serve God, so I've, I've handled the freedom. I'm coming to what it means to serve God. So we are free. So we have said that the freedom is not a rigid one. We are freed. But the freedom is that we should love others such that our freedom does not disturb their peace. So if you are doing something and it's disturbing your brother or your sister, you consider that brother and sister because your freedom and your service to God is within your heart. It is not a rigid thing. So that is why the Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You have power to control whatever anointing that has come upon you. Whatever anointing that you carry, you have power to control that anointing. So you don't let spirituality override common sense to the point that you disturb others with the so-called freedom that you have. We are living in the freedom. They say freedom and justice. So you do everything you want. No. That is not what it is. Christian freedom has its limits. The limit is that you love people to the point that you don't do things to disturb their peace. Hallelujah. So let's look at the service. The service. So we've been freed to serve. So if we say to serve, what does that mean? All of our scripture, we are told to serve the Lord. In Psalm 100 verse 2, it says to serve the Lord with gladness. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says serve the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul joshua says as for me and my house we will serve the lord joshua 24 15 and paul says in romans 12 11 he says that serve the lord but then in mark 10 45 jesus says the son of man came not to be served but to serve this is the contradiction <laughs> everywhere says serve the lord but Jesus comes to say, the Son of Man came to serve, but to be not to be served. So, so is Jesus contradicting the Word of God? Of course not. We'll look into that. So, everywhere says that we should serve the Lord. Who is our God? Jesus Christ. But now He Himself comes and says, He did not come to be served, but to serve. So, that is a major issue people are dealing with. But let's look at it. From the scripture what is this peculiar kind of service to god in matthew 6 24 jesus said no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and money so in this context so the question is how do you serve money use this to explain i want to use this to explain that will be a Serving money doesn't mean doing things to meet money's needs. Serving money doesn't mean to do things to meet money's needs. You serve money by calculating all your plans, your efforts, to benefit from what money promises you. You calculate your whole life to benefit from what money promises you. Your life is revolves around trying to put yourself in the position of the greatest benefit from money that's also what it means to serve god you serve god by calculating all your plans and all your efforts to benefit 
from all that God promises to be for you. Your life revolves around trying to put yourself under the waterfall of God's greatest blessings, positioning yourself to the greatest benefit God has to give you, namely for himself. So to conclude, yes, God enlists us into his service, which means he calls us to have a part in accomplishing his purposes, not meeting his needs. And he accomplishes his purposes precisely by supplying the grace to do our work for him because the giver gets the glory. The servant gets the joy. That is what I mentioned earlier. The giver gets the glory. The servant gets the joy. That's God's purpose for his work, for, the, for his work, his glory and the joy of his people in him. Hallelujah. So, to serve God, to serve God is not to come and serve as a servant, as a bond servant in that sense. You do things for God to get the glory and you in turn get the joy. There is so much joy that you can get from serving God. I once, one time I traveled and now when I was sitting at the airport waiting for my flight to come to Ghana, I met a lady, you know, I love, you know, I checked out from my hotel um, close to 12 because at 12, then it means that I'm booking another day. So, and my flight was 11 p.m. So I took a decision not to pay for another night. I will go sit at the airport and wait till 11 p.m. and take my flight. So, while I was sitting there, you know, you see a lot of people. So, I gave myself some some game to play. So, I look at the people, all the blacks that are coming there. I want to figure figure out who is the Ghanaian, who is a, a Nigerian, who is a, 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 a Kenyan, and who is that. So, I was doing all that just to while away the time. You know, you know, at a point it gets so boring. So, I decided to play that game. So, then one woman walks around and seeing her face i decided to engage her in conversation so we sat together and we were talking apparently this is a woman who had worked in the bank for so many years pursued what we call career woman did all the courses rose to become a manager of a branch and doing very well in in the banking sector doing very well but she said one thing that was striking she said that at a point she realized that she had lost um, her family. They were still living together, but she realized that there's no bonding. She had lost her family. I said, how is that? She said, all along I've been working. I go to work. I come home late. On weekends, I go for classes just to pursue my career. And I got all that. But at the, by the time I finished, um, my relationship with my husband wasn't the best. My children didn't know me, even though I showered them with all the things that I needed to give them, but they didn't know me because I was never around. So she said at the point she felt so empty that she decided to quit the job. And when she took her money, she decided to do China Ghana business. So she goes to China to buy goods and then brings it to Ghana, come and give it out to some distributors and then she waits for her money and goes back and while she was she she waited for her money she would take time and stay with the family cook for the children take them to school serve them and serve them well and make them happy and she said that when she took that decision she now finds fulfillment in life now she has time for church in those days saturdays Friday evening she goes for classes the whole of saturday she's in class then sunday she decides to rest she has only sunday so even going to church was not regular so she, that she had lost all her relationships she said that she was sick so eventually she took this important decision and that is how she got her life back so you see this is somebody who became a servant to money so everything she did was to make sure it inures into some benefit that comes as a, uh, as as in money but she realized that that was taking her life away so when the bible says that you cannot serve god and serve mammon that is what it means 
So you re now replace that that ambition with doing things that will give glory to God. And when God gets the glory, you get your joy. So this is what happened to the woman. She got everything that she wanted in many terms, but she lost her joy. So service to God actually is to make you give glory to God in whatever you did, and then in turn you get the joy. Because after all, life is about self-satisfaction and joy. If you did anything that did not give you satisfaction and joy in life, then you are missing it. That is why people pursue all manner of courses, but at the end of the day, they don't use that to work. I know a man at Abosoka in Accra, he, he trained as a pharmacist. He's a full pharmacist, but he still sells spare parts at Abosoka. Mm -hmm. The day I got to know that, I was amazed. I was totally amazed. That is why there are doctors, medical doctors, who have become pastors today, and they don't practice medicine anymore. So you see, you do something, you serve God in a way that gives him glory, and then you get the joy of service. Let me just conclude. Let me just conclude. The Bible teaches us almost everywhere that human beings are to serve God. And when the Son of God comes into the world, we are to serve him. In the Old Testament, Joshua says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. And then Paul, Paul celebrates the Thessalonian converts because you turned to God from idols to serve the living God, the living true God. First of Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. Over and over again, Paul calls himself and he calls Christians servants, literally slaves of Christ and of God. Romans 1 verse 1, Ephesians 6 verse 6. Peter does the same in 1 Peter 2 16 and 2 Peter 1 1. It is unmistakable. One is to call ourselves servants or slaves of God and of Christ. Look at this. For example, in John 15, 15, Jesus says to his disciples, No longer do I call you servants or slaves, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. And yet, in John 15, 14, the preceding verse, he says, You are my friends, if you do what I command you. What kind of a friend is that? What kind of friend of a friend is that? If you are not my servant, you are my friends. What kind of friendship is that? God says, if I were hungry, I would not call you, for the world and its fullness are mine. You call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. That is the point. You shall glorify me. Psalm 50, verse 12, and verse 15. Yes, serve God, but not by presuming to meet his need. Nobody can meet God's need. He owns everything. He doesn't need your supply. We call on him in need, not the other way around. And the second point is that the Son of Man came not to be saved. That's a pretty clear warning, but to save and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark chapter 10 verse 45. He saves us. We don't save him. He meets our need. We don't meet his need. Then in Romans 4, 4 to 5, you can't get much more basic than this. Paul describes how the Christian life begins. Are we justified and put right with God by working for God? And in a way, or by trusting him to work for us in our utter hopelessness? Here is the quote. To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies, and ungod the God, justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We did not get right with God in the beginning of our Christian life by serving him for a wage of salvation. He worked for us. He served us, not as him. Not as him. He did the humanly impossible on the cross. So, the longest shot of all this is that, number one, number one, freedom to serve. Freedom means that Christ died to set us free from sin and death. 
and that freedom is not to say we can go on a jamboree and do whatever we like mm -hmm. and there is no strict law to restrict us from so many things as bond servants who are freed but you see our freedom is to the point that whatever you are doing you measure it in love to your brother and your sister if what we are doing is within your freedom to do but it disturbs other people you look at it and say no because of my brother i want him to be one for christ so let my freedom cease from here i'll restrict myself so that i can win them for christ so that is number one number two the service is such that we are not serving to end a witch we are not serving as born servants we are serving because we love god and we want to do it to give him glory and while we have said and you see god does not need us to serve him the bible says that he is capable of raising even stones and in fact the bible says that it is god who hardened the heart of pharaoh so that through the hardness of his heart he can perform so many miracles so that the children of god will see that he is god who has sent moses and give him glory so that the glory can be for him so you see god can do anything he can do anything so when you are serving god it is for our own joy that we are serving him we serve god to receive joy that is where the satisfaction of a human being comes in so for the business people who use the maslow hierarchy of needs and goes through clothing food and all that and get to self-actualization when many of them after they have made their millions and don't know what to do with it then they now want to become president even though they are not president materials they just want to get some satisfaction and which they still don't get the satisfaction the joy in life is about serving god the joy in life is about serving god and when you serve god he takes the glory and then when you have finished glorifying him it makes you joyful and that is the true satisfaction if satisfaction were in business, in satisfaction were in many women in satisfaction were in assets in satisfaction were in titles in satisfaction were in big things in satisfaction were in mansions satisfaction were in chieftaincy and 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 kingship king solomon told us that king solomon finished everything he said fear god and serve him god bless you my brothers and my sisters this is all i can share with you god bless you so much baba vinci i'll leave the prayer i will leave the prayer for you to do. thank you very much and god bless you hallelujah Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. The word has come. And I am Amen. going to sum it up. Within 5578, it says, A church to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to faith, and fit it for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all be my power and gain to do my master's will. Arm me with jealous care, ask me thy sight to live. And oh, thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray. And on thyself rely, assured, if I may trust, betray, I shall forever die. 